Chapter One: A Spoilt Little Girl. Mary Lennox was spoilt, rude, and had a bad temper. Because she was often ill, she was thin with a sad face. She complained a lot. No one liked her at all. This was not really Mary's fault. She lived in India with her mother and father, but she did not see her parents very often. Mary's father was busy with his work, and her mother was a very beautiful woman who loved parties and was not interested in her small daughter. She left Mary in the care of an Indian nanny called an ayah. Her ayah let Mary do what she wanted. Because she didn't want Mary to cry and irritate her mother, Mary soon became a spoilt and unpleasant young girl. When Mary was nine years old, she woke up one hot morning, and felt that there was something wrong. She heard strange cries and shouts, and the sound of feet outside her door, but no one came to see her. She went back to sleep. Later, when Mary woke up, the house was silent. She heard nothing. Mary was angry because no one came to bring her food or to dress her. Suddenly, her door opened, and two Englishmen entered. Mary looked at them angrily. Why has everyone forgotten me? She asked. Where is my ayah? Why does no one come? Poor little kid, said one of the men. There is nobody here. That is how Mary discovered that her mother and father were dead, and that the servants were dead too because of a terrible disease. That was why the house was so silent. Mary Lennox was completely alone. There was no one in India to look after Mary, so she went to England to live with her uncle, Mr. Craven, who lived in a big house in Yorkshire called Misselthwaite Manor. Mrs. Medlock, her uncle's housekeeper, met Mary in London. Mary disliked Mrs. Medlock immediately. But this was nothing new, because Mary disliked everyone. Mrs. Medlock did not like Mary. She thought that the little girl was bad-tempered, rude, and plain, and she was right. During the long train journey to Yorkshire, Mrs. Medlock told Mary about the house where she was going to live. It seemed very large and gloomy, and it was near the edge of a moor. There's nothing for you to do there, and your uncle is not interested in you," said Mrs. Medlock. "He's got a crooked back. He was a sour young man until he married." Mary listened more carefully now. She did not know that her uncle was married. His wife was very pretty, and he loved her very much. When she died, he became even stranger," Mrs. Medlock said. "Oh, did she die?" Asked Mary. Yes, and now he likes nobody. He's away most of the time, so you must look after yourself. It was dark and raining when they got out of the train. They travelled to the house by horse and carriage, but Mary could see nothing outside because of the rain and the darkness of the night. What is a moor? Mary asked. It's miles and miles of land," replied Mrs. Medlock. "Very little grows on it, and nothing lives on it except ponies and sheep." The carriage stopped at last in a courtyard. A butler opened a heavy wooden door. "Take her to her room," he said to Mrs. Medlock. "The master doesn't want to see her." He's going to London tomorrow. Mrs. Medlock took Mary upstairs, along many corridors, to.
to a room with a fire burning in it and food on the table. Well, here you are, said Mrs. Medlock. This is where you'll live. This room and the next is where you must stay. You can't go into the other parts of the house. Don't forget that. Mary Lennox felt terribly alone. Chapter 2 Mary visits the gardens. The next morning, Mary woke up when a young housemaid came into her room to light the fire. Her name was Martha, and she talked to Mary while she worked. Mary didn't understand servants who were friendly. In India, she had spoken to servants only to give them orders. She never said, please or thank you. Once, she had even slapped her Aya's face when she was angry with her. Somehow, she knew that she must not behave in this way with Martha. At first, Mary did not listen to Martha, but after a while, she began to like the sound of the friendly Yorkshire voice. You should see all my little brothers and sisters in our little cottage on the moor, Martha said. There's twelve of us, and my father only earns sixteen shillings a week. It is hard for my mother to feed them all. The fresh air on the moor makes them strong and healthy. Ah, Dickens, twelve. He's always out on the moor. He's good with animals. He's tamed a wild pony. Go and look at the gardens, Martha said. There's not much growing now, but they're lovely in summer. She paused for a moment and then said quietly, One of the gardens is locked up. No one has been in it for ten years. Why? asked Mary. Mr Craven closed it after his wife died. It was her garden. He locked the door, dug a hole and buried the key. The enormous grounds of Misselthwaite Manor were divided by high walls into many gardens. In some there were flowers, trees and fountains. Vegetables grew in others. Doors opened from garden into garden. Because it was winter, the trees were bare and no flowers grew. Mary thought that it all looked very empty and ugly. After a while, an old man came through one of the doors. He had a surly old face and did not seem at all pleased to see Mary. Can I go through that door? Mary asked. Uh, if you like, he replied. There's nothing to see. Mary hoped that she might find the door to the locked garden. She tried many doors, but they all opened easily. Then she noticed one wall that was covered in ivy, but seemed to have no door in it. She could see tall trees behind the ivy-covered wall. A robin on a high branch started to sing. She stopped to listen, and the little bird with the red breast seemed almost to be calling to her. His cheerful song brought a small smile to her sad face. The old man continued digging. He ignored Mary until at last she said, There's a garden over there without a door. What garden? He asked angrily. On the other side of the wall, she answered. I saw a robin in the trees over there. The old man stopped digging and, to Mary's surprise, he smiled. He looked quite different when he smiled. He whistled very softly. Then a wonderful thing happened. There was a sound of wings and the robin came down next to the man's foot. Here he is, the old man chuckled. <laughs> he always comes to me when I whistle. <laughs> Isn't he a nice little bird? The robin hopped about pecking at the earth. The gardener, Ben Weatherstaff, continued digging. He's the only friend I've got. 
he said. I've never had any friends, said Mary sadly. Ben stopped digging and looked at Mary. You and I are the same then, he said to her. We're not good looking and we're as sour as we look. It was the first time that Mary had ever thought about her angry face and bad temper. Now that she did, she felt uncomfortable. Just then, the clear sound of the robin song made her look towards the apple tree where he sat. Ben Weatherstaff laughed. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do that for? asked Mary. He's decided to be your friend, replied Ben. He's taken a fancy to you. To me, said Mary, and she moved softly towards the little tree and looked up. Would you make friends with me? She said gently to the robin, as if she was speaking to a person. Why? said Ben quietly. You said that like a real child instead of a little old woman. You said it almost like Dickon when he talks to his wild things out on the moor. The robin flew over the wall. There must be a door to that garden, Mary said firmly. There's no door that you can find, and in any case, it's none of your business, Ben said sharply. Don't poke your nose in where it doesn't belong. The gardener walked away without saying goodbye. Chapter Three A Cry in the Night. Mary spent most of her days outside in the grounds. The cold wind made her cheeks pink, and each evening she ate all of her food. After dinner, she liked to sit near the fire and talk to Martha. Why does Mr. Craven hate the locked garden? Mary asked once. It was Mrs. Craven's garden. She loved it. She and Mr. Craven looked after the flowers together. No gardeners were allowed in. But what happened? Mary asked impatiently. Mrs. Craven was sitting on a branch of a tree when it broke and she fell. She was injured so badly she died. That's why Mr. Craven hates the garden. He won't let anyone ever talk about it. Mary had never felt sorry for anyone before, but now she realized how unhappy her uncle must be. The wind moaned around the house, banging at the doors and windows. Martha said it was Wuthering. Mary listened, and through the noise, she thought that she heard a child crying. Do you hear someone crying? She asked Martha. Martha suddenly looked confused. No, she answered. It's only the wind or the scullery maid. She's cried all day with toothache. Then Martha quickly left the room. Next day it rained. Mary was bored and complained to Martha that she had nothing to do. On a day like this at home, we all try to keep busy indoors, Martha said. Except Dickon, he goes out on the moor in all types of weather. He brought home a fox cub that he found. He's got a crow too called Soot. When Martha left her alone, Mary decided to explore the house. She went along corridors and up and down stairs. In the silence of the house, she heard again the sound of a child crying. She stopped to listen at a door, but then another door opened, and out came Mrs. Medlock. "What are you doing here?" she said, and she took Mary by the arm and pulled her away. "Get back to your room at once." I didn't know which way to go, and then I heard someone crying," said Mary. You didn't hear anything," said Mrs. Medlock. "Go back to your room, or I'll tell the master that you disobeyed him." Mary was angry. She wanted to know what the cry was. Soon the storm passed. 
Wait until the sun shines and lights up the moor, said Martha. I'd love to see your cottage on the moor and meet your mother, said Mary. You would like my mother, Martha said. She's kind and good tempered and works hard. When it's my day off and I can go home and see her, I jump for joy. I'd like to see Dickon too, said Mary. Yes, you'd like him, Martha said. Everyone likes Dickon. No one likes me, said Mary sadly. Maybe that's because you don't like yourself, laughed Martha. I never thought of that, said Mary. Mary found Ben Weatherstaff working in the garden. Spring's coming, he said. The plants are growing under the soil. Soon you'll see crocuses and daffodils. Mary saw that the robin was on a wall covered with ivy. He hopped down to the soil at her feet. The robin tried to find a worm in the garden. Suddenly, Mary saw an old rusty key. Perhaps it's been buried for ten years, she said to herself. Perhaps it's the key to the garden, she thought, putting it into her pocket. After supper, Martha told Mary all about her day at home. Mother has sent you a present, she said. She brought out a skipping rope with striped handles and showed Mary how to skip. Your mother is very kind, Mary said. She wondered how Mary's mother could find the money to buy her the rope with all those hungry mouths to feed. Mary skipped all the time, and the more she skipped, the stronger she grew. Her cheeks became red. And her plain face started to look almost pretty. One day, as Mary watched the robin in the garden, a wonderful thing happened. To Mary, it was almost like magic. A small gust of wind blew aside some of the ivy on the wall, and beneath the leaves, she saw a door. She remembered that she had the key in her pocket. She tried it in the lock, and although it was very stiff, she turned it. The next moment, she stood inside the secret garden. It was the loveliest and most mysterious-looking place that Mary had seen. It was overgrown and untidy. But she could see plants starting to push their way up through the soil. She pulled weeds away to make space for the spring flowers to grow. Now they look as if they can breathe, she thought. Then she whispered to herself, "I am the first person who has spoken in here for ten years." Time passed quickly as Mary cleared the weeds and dead grass. Soon it was time to go back to the house for her supper. Mary wanted to tell Martha her secret, but she knew that this was not a good idea. She might be forbidden to go into the secret garden again, so instead she said, "I would like a little garden to grow things in." Why, that's just what you need to keep you busy," said Martha. "I'll get Dickon to bring some garden tools and some seeds to plant." Mary worked with her hands each day in the secret garden. She was careful not to let Ben Weatherstaff see where she went. But Ben noticed a change in her. One day he said, "The fresh air is good for you. You're less thin, and your skin is less yellow." Chapter Four, Dickon. One day, Mary saw a boy sitting under a tree. He seemed about twelve years old. He played on a pipe. Two rabbits and a squirrel were near him. They seemed to listen to the tune he played. The boy got up carefully because he didn't want to frighten the animals. He had blue eyes. And a round, 
pink face. I'm Deacon, he said to Mary. I've brought the garden tools and some flower seeds. Deacon had a kind and gentle smile, and Mary felt that she knew him quite well. She felt that if the wild animals could trust him, then she could trust him too. Do you know about the secret garden? asked Mary. I've heard about it, Dickon answered. But I don't know where it is. Come with me, Mary said. Mary was careful that no one saw them, and then she took Dickon through the door in the wall. Dickon was very surprised. This is a strange, pretty place, he said. It's like being in a dream. Dickon looked around at all the plants and trees which Mary thought were dead. All of these will grow, he said. There'll be flowers and roses everywhere in a few weeks. Dickon and Mary worked together to clear away the weeds and dead wood. Mary felt that she had never known anyone like Dickon. She tried to speak in a warm, friendly voice. Like Dickens and Martha's. Do you like me? She asked. Yes, I do. He laughed. The robin likes you too. That evening after dinner, Mrs. Medlock took Mary to see Mr. Craven. He's going abroad tomorrow, and he wants to see you first. She said. Mary felt a little afraid. She felt sure that she would not like Mr. Craven, and that he would not like her. But she found that Mr. Craven wasn't really frightening, and that his back wasn't really crooked. His face was handsome, but he looked sad and worried. He asked Mary if there was anything that she would like. Mary asked for a piece of garden in which to grow her own flowers. Of course," said her uncle. "You may take any bit that is not used." Mary was delighted. Now she could have the secret garden for herself. That same night, Mary was awakened by the wind roaring around the house. She couldn't sleep, and as she lay in bed, she heard the crying noise again. That's not the wind," she thought. "I'm going to find out where that noise is coming from." Mary took a candle to light her way along the dark corridors. Suddenly, she noticed a light from under one of the doors. The crying sound came from behind the door, and Mary knew that it was a child. She gently opened the door. And saw that a young boy lay on the bed, crying. <laughs> When the boy saw Mary, he stopped crying at once. "Are you a ghost?" he asked. He looked very frightened. "No, I'm Mary Lennox," she answered. "Who are you?" Chapter Five, Colin. I'm Colin. Mr. Craven's son," said the boy. "Then I must be your cousin," Mary said. "Don't you know that I came to live here?" "No," he answered. "No one told me." "Why?" asked Mary. "Because I am afraid that people will see me. I won't let people see me and talk about me." "Why?" asked Mary. She felt more puzzled with each moment that passed. "Because I'm always ill, and I must stay in bed." The servants are not allowed to speak about me. My father won't let anyone mention me. He's afraid I'll grow up to have a crooked back. My father hates me because my mother died when I was born. Have you always been here? Asked Mary. Nearly always, said Colin. If I go out, people stare at me, and I hate it. If you don't like people to see you, Mary said, "Shall I go away?" Oh no, Colin replied quickly. You must stay and talk to me. Mary put her candle down on a table near the bed, and sat on a chair. They talked for a long time. Colin wanted to know all about Mary and about her life at Misselthwaite. 
He told her how unhappy and lonely he was, even though he was given anything that he wanted. Everyone must do as I say, Colin said. I will be ill if they don't. Do you think you will get well? Mary asked. I don't suppose I will, Colin answered. No one believes I will live until I grow up. Let's talk about something else. How old are you? I'm ten, like you, Mary said. How do you know I'm ten? He asked. Because when you were born, your father locked the garden door and buried the key. It's been locked for ten years, Mary answered. What garden? Colin asked. It was the garden Mr. Craven hates, said Mary nervously. He locked the door. No one knew where he buried the key. What's the garden like? Colin persisted. It's been locked for ten years, Mary said carefully. She did not want him to know that she had found it, but it was too late to be careful. Colin was very excited at the idea of a hidden garden. I will make them open the door, he said. Oh no! cried Mary. Let's keep it a secret. If they open the door, it will never be a secret again. If we find the door one day, we can go inside, and no one will know about it except us. I would like that," said Colin. "I've never had a secret before." He was tired from talking, and as he fell asleep, Mary went quietly away. Chapter Six. Wet weather. Next morning, Mary told Martha that she had found Colin. Martha was very upset. She thought that she could lose her job for allowing Mary to find the young boy. Don't worry," said Mary. "Colin was pleased to see me. He wants to see me every day." "You must have bewitched him," said Martha. "What's the matter with him?" Mary asked. Martha told Mary that Colin had never been allowed to walk. His father thought that his back was weak, even though a famous doctor had examined him and said that he would get strong if less fuss was made of him. Colin was still spoilt and allowed to do everything that he wanted. Colin thinks he will die," said Mary. "Mother says that he has no reason to live if he's closed up in his room all the time," said Martha. "It's good for me to be outside," said Mary. Do you think that it would help Colin? Oh, I don't know," Martha said. "He had a bad temper tantrum when he was taken into the garden. He was upset because he thought one of the gardeners was looking at him. He cried until he felt ill. If he ever gets angry with me, I won't go to see him again," said Mary. When Mary next went to see Colin, she told him about Dickon. "He's not like anyone else," she said. All the animals on the moor love him. When he plays his pipe, they come to listen. The moor must be a wonderful place," said Colin. "But I can't go there. I'm going to die." How do you know that? Mary asked. She felt a little cross with Colin. He seemed to be pleased with the thought that he could die. Because everyone says I will die," Colin replied. "I think that my father will be pleased when I'm dead." I don't believe that," Mary said. "The famous doctor was right. They should make much less fuss of you and allow you to go out. If you could see Dickon, you'd want to get well." Then Mary told Colin about Dickon's family, who had no money but were all healthy and cheerful. It rained for a week, so Mary could not visit the garden because the weather was so bad. She spent most of her time with Colin. They read books and talked together, and for the first time, Mary heard Colin laugh. Colin often spoke about the secret garden and wondered what was in it. Mary felt that she could not tell him her secret yet, so she still did not tell him that she knew where the mysterious garden was. I'll wait until the rain stops before I decide what to do, thought Mary. On the day that the rain finished, Mary woke up early to find that the sunlight was streaming through her windows. She went quickly to the secret garden, and she found that Dickon was already there. I couldn't stay in bed in a morning like this," he said. "Look at the garden." 
the rain and sunshine had made the new plants start to come through the earth. There were some purple, orange, and gold crocuses. Mary was very pleased to see them, and she kissed them. The robin was building a nest. We mustn't watch too closely, Dickon said. He'll stay here with us if we don't frighten him. A whole week had gone by since Mary had seen Dickon. She told him that she had found Colin. If he comes out here in the garden, he'll forget that he's ill. Dickon said. He'll be another child, looking at the flowers and animals like us. When Mary went back to the house at the end of the day, Martha told her that Colin was angry because she had not been to see him. I won't allow that boy to come here if you stay with him instead of me. Colin said. If you send Dickon away, I'll never come into this room again. Mary replied. You're selfish. Colin raged. What about you? Mary replied furiously. You're the most selfish boy I know. Well, I'm going to die. Colin said. No, you're not. Mary replied. You just say that to make people feel sorry for you, but they don't feel sorry. You're too nasty. Mary marched to the door and then said angrily, "I was going to tell you all about Dickon and his fox and crow, but I won't now." She slammed the door behind her. Later, when Mary remembered how lonely Colin was, she felt sorry for him. "I'll go and see him tomorrow," she thought. "I'll go and sit with him." Later that night, Mary was awakened by the sound of screaming and crying. <laughs> It's Colin having one of his tempers, she thought. She put her hands over her ears, but she could not block out the terrible noise. Someone should stop him, she cried. He deserves to be punished for being so selfish. He's woken everyone in the house. She ran into Colin's room and shouted at him, "Stop!" I hate you. Everyone hates you. You'll scream until you die, and I hope that you do. Chapter Seven. I will live for ever and ever. Colin looked terrible. His face was swollen from crying, but Mary was too angry to care. If you scream again, then I will scream louder. She told him. I can't stop. Colin sobbed. There's something wrong with my back. I will have a crooked back, and then I will die. Turn over and let me look at your back, Mary said. She looked at the poor thin back for a long time. There's nothing wrong with it. Your back is as straight as mine, she told him. Colin stopped crying, and Mary sat by his bed, talking to him quietly until he fell asleep. The next morning, Mary met Dickon in the garden, and she told him about Colin crying in the night. We must get him out here, poor boy," said Dickon kindly. "Yes, we must," said Mary, using the same kind Yorkshire voice. Dickon laughed. "Talking your Yorkshire voice to Colin," he said. "It'll make him laugh, and Mother says laughing is good for people when they're ill." Mary went to see Colin later that day. She told him about Dickon and his squirrels, who were called Nut and Shell. Then Colin said, "I'm sorry, I said that I would send Dickon away. He seems a wonderful boy." I'm glad you said that," said Mary, "because he's coming to see you, and he's bringing his animals." Colin suddenly looked cheerful. He looked so happy that Mary thought that she would tell him her great secret. That's not all. She said, "There's something even better. I found the door to the garden." Colin was very pleased. Then we can go in and find out what's inside. He cried. Mary waited for a moment, and then she told him the truth. I've been inside. That's why I could tell you so much about it. I couldn't tell you my secret until I was sure that I could trust you. At breakfast, Colin told his nurse. A boy and his animals are coming to see me. Bring them straight up when they arrive. Soon afterwards, Mary heard a bleating. <coughs> That's Dickens' lamb. <coughs> She said, "They're coming." 
Dickon came in. He was smiling. He carried a lamb, and his little fox followed behind him. The squirrel sat on one shoulder, and the crow on the other. The other squirrel was in his pocket. Colin stared in surprise. Dickon gave the lamb to Colin and handed him a bottle to feed it. The little boy was busy and happy. After a while, Colin cried, "I must see it all. I must see the secret garden." Yes, of course you must," said Mary. "And you must lose no time about it." They put Colin in his wheelchair, and Dickon pushed it along the garden paths. Mary told Colin all about the places they passed on their way to the door that led to the secret garden. "Here's where I met Ben Weatherstaff," she said, "and this is where I saw the robin." Then she said quietly to him, "This is a secret garden." Mary looked around to make sure that no one was watching, and then Dickon pushed the chair quickly inside. Colin looked at the trees and flowers. He listened to the sweet sound of the birds singing, and he felt the warm sun on his face. His pale skin started to become pink as he breathed in the good fresh air. Then he cried out, "I will be well. I will live for ever and ever." That day, the world changed for Colin. It's been a wonderful day," said Dickon. "It certainly has," replied Mary. "Do you think," said Colin, "that it was made like this just for me?" "You sound almost as Yorkshire as Dickon now," laughed Mary. "I don't want this day to finish, but I will come back every day," Colin said. Chapter Eight, Magic. Of course you will," said Dickon. "Soon we'll have you working and walking." But suddenly, Ben Weatherstaff's angry face looked down at them from the top of the wall. "What are you doing in there?" he shouted angrily at Mary. Then he saw Colin, and his mouth opened in astonishment. "Do you know who I am?" Colin asked. "Yes." Of course I do," Ben answered. "You are the poor boy who is always ill." Colin sat up angrily. "There's nothing wrong with me. I'll show you," he cried. He pulled himself up out of his chair, and with Dickon's help, he stood up straight and tall. "Look at me," he shouted at Ben. "Just look at me." "You dear boy," said Ben, and he cried with happiness. Colin stayed standing. Suddenly, he felt all his fears leave him. I'm not afraid any more," he cried. "It's the magic of the secret garden, the magic that made all the plants grow strong, has made me grow strong too." That evening, when Colin sat with Mary, he was quiet. "I'm not going to be a poor, sad boy any more. If I believe that I will be strong and well, then the magic will make it happen." The next day, when the children went into the garden, Colin told Dickon and Mary to watch him. "I'm going to show you that the magic made we will," he said. Carefully, taking a few steps at a time, Colin walked around the garden. His face glowed with joy. "Please keep this a secret," he said. "When I can walk and run really well, I will walk into my father's study and say." Here I am, as well and strong as any boy in Yorkshire. It was not easy to keep Colin's secret. The magic garden made Colin's eyes shine, and his pale face become pink. Each day, Colin and Mary did exercises to make them strong, and soon they were happier and healthier. Mary looked pretty, and Colin didn't look ill any more. Everyone who knew them wondered about the change. At the time that the secret garden made its magic for Colin, Mr. Craven travelled in distant countries. For ten years, he had tried to run away from his sorrow, and nothing could comfort him. Then, one day while he walked in Austria, he sat down by a stream. He felt his mind and his body start to relax. 
the gentle sound of the running water filled him with peace. And suddenly, he was both healthy and happy. That same night, he dreamt about his wife's garden at Misselthwaite Manor. The dream made him decide to return home at once. As soon as he arrived home, he went to the garden. As he walked slowly towards the door of the secret garden, all his sadness came rushing back to him. He wondered how he could find the key to the garden, and then he heard laughter from the other side of the wall. Then the door opened, and a boy ran out. He was a tall, handsome boy, and Mr. Craven gazed at him without speaking. Colin stood still and looked at his father in surprise. Then he said, Father, I'm Colin, your son. You can't believe it, but it's true. Colin took his father into the garden and told him how the magic had made the flowers and trees grow and had made him grow strong and healthy. Mr. Craven thought that it was a wonderful story. He sat down next to Mary, Dickon and the animals and talked and laughed for the first time in many years. He was so proud of his happy, healthy son. Now there will be no more secrets, said Colin. I will never need my wheelchair again. I will walk with you, father. They all stood up and walked back to the house. Mrs. Medlock and Martha watched in amazement as Mr. Craven walked across the lawn, happier than they had ever seen him. Next to him, with his head held up high and his eyes full of laughter, walked Colin, as strongly and steadily as any boy in Yorkshire. Mm -hmm.